WA Primary Health Alliance presents this video lecture on the treatment of depression in primary care. It's been developed to support implementation of the Alliance Against Depression, an integrated approach to tackling depression and suicide. The lecture is delivered by Dr. Daniel Rock and Dr. Jeff Riley. Dr. Riley draws on this extensive experience to present on how to effectively identify and manage the depressed patient in primary care. He also shares his insights on overcoming the challenges and on how to recognise the suicidal patient. Dr Rock presents some of the context and evidence on depression and multimorbidity in our population. He also introduces the principle of the Alliance Against Depression, an approach recognised as the world's best practice for the care of people with depression and in the prevention of suicide. Thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Daniel Rock. I'm from the WA Primary Health Alliance and today I'm going to be talking about another alliance which is the Alliance Against Depression in Western Australia. Depression is important because depression is common in primary care. It's potentially fatal but it's treatable. So they're the most important disorders in primary care, by far the most important mental disorders in primary care because of their prevalence, that they're recurrent and sometimes chronic. They can hit everybody Everybody can get depression. They're severe, potentially life-threatening because the, they are closely linked with suicidal behaviour. Yet there are effective treatments available. But there are large, large diagnostic and therapeutic deficits. So it's the disorder for the largest room for improvement in primary care. And if we look at burden of disease in Australia, years of living with disability, the largest burden of disease living with disability in Australia are mental disorders, primarily depression and anxiety. In fact, 25% of the years of living with disability due to burden of disease in Australia are related to depression, yet it is treatable. And if we look in general practice, it's common to, have, to see patients with multimorbidity. Thir over 30 or 40% of the presentations in general practice are related to multimorbidity, that is patients with two or more chronic conditions. So if you take a, a typical patient, a patient with diabetes, 20% of those individuals will have a depressive disorder when they're seen in primary care. More than depressive symptoms, they have a depressive disorder. Of that pairing, 25% will also have a painful condition. So that triad creates complications and difficulties for general practitioners to manage. If we look at suicide in Western Australia, suicide, 409 people killed themselves in Western Australia in 2017. The majority of those individuals were male and the majority of those were living in the metropolitan area. And many of those individuals in the period preceding their suicide had seen a GP. And to understand this, we need to understand that depression and suicidal behaviour are, are more than simply a reaction to stress, to burnout, or to difficult life circumstances. And that GPs, GPs, not psychiatrists, GPs look after the majority of people with depression in Australia. And GPs see patients with depression in the context of multimorbidity. So I've described earlier about patients with diabetes. The common multimorbid triangle is a cardiometabolic condition, say heart failure, combined with a painful condition, say osteoarthritis, and depression. And that confounds the diagnosis and complicates the treatment options. So if we take 100 people in the community who have a depressive episode, 60 to 70% of those people will be seen in, a gen in, seen in general practice, of which half will be diagnosed at their first appointment with depression by their GP. And that's sometimes cited as a low rate. In fact, it's a very good rate. It's a far higher rate than other, some other specialty, specialties diagnose depression in patients. But the problem comes in the context of multimorbidity is treatment. Less than half of the people diagnosed with depression in primary care will be treated according to guidelines. And of those treated, a very small proportion will still be in treatment at three months. So the treatment dropout rate is very high. Hi, I'm Jeff Riley. I'm going to talk a little about the 
some of the clinical aspects of uh, depressive disorders. Um, st I want to pick up where Danny left off talking about uh, detection and recognition in, of depressive disorders in general practice and uh, talk to initially about the difficulties. It has to be acknowledged that depressive disorders can be quite difficult to diagnose and I want to discuss that a little bit to begin with. Clearly of course some of the non-specific aspects of general practice go against it. As you know, time uh, is a, the main problem and these disorders, like all mental disorders, need more time generally, so clearly time is an issue. Um, and the traditional aspect characteristics, if you like, of general practice, uh, uh, early presentation, uh, un uh, undifferentiated patients and so on, all of these things are, you know, are part of the lives of general practitioners, which all uh, have another layer of difficulty in the context of uh, mental disorders. So depressive disorders are also are, are kind of there embedded in this morass of distress that GPs see. It recently said that 40% of patients that GPs see are, are distressed in some sense and other figures of psychiatric illness in general practice have been as high as 60 and more percent. And of course it depends about uh, depends how you define mental illness. But the, talking about patients also, the specific aspects of depression that add to the difficulty. Patients don't come talking about depression. They talk particularly, uh, they're more likely to present a somatic symptom as you know. And as Danny's talk discussed the, uh, the notion of multimorbidity, that their disorders are often comorbid and GPs not unreasonably have a bias towards looking at physical illness and so on. So there's a whole lot of aspects of the, the nature of the doctors and the, the nature of um, uh, the, the patients and the way they present, often in this masked form of depression in various ways with a physical symptom and uh, other things. But I think the, perhaps the most important difficulty with uh, uh, diagnosing de depressive disorders and, and distinguishing the different types of depressive disorders has been uh, the recent or over the last several decades the development of the uh, American Psychiatric Association's um, DSM classification. The difficulty with that classification is that or the, the problem with that classification is that it stripped away a very very valuable insight which was embedded in the old language that we used to use, which was uh, endogenous and reactive depression. The implications of endogenous and reactive, of course, were, were that endogenous was biological, uh, reactive depression, psychological, and of course that's far too simplistic. But embedded in there is an important idea, which is classifications should predict treatment, and the, that biological component uh, of uh, depression is most important. So what we're doing unapologetically uh, in the Alliance is, uh, if you like, rehabilitating that classification in the form of Gordon Parker's distinction using the terms melancholia and non-melancholia, or non-melancholic depression and uh, melancholic depression. And the importance that's there is that melancholic depression uh, is the characterised by neurovegetative syndrome and it, uh, which, and we've known since the 1950s when antidepressants were developed, particularly when amitriptyline became available, um, it was clearly demonstrated that, uh, that, that the neurovegetative syndrome responded to amitriptyline. Specifically, the drugs treat that syndrome and they don't they may not have a particularly useful role in non-melancholic depression. Now, if that's true, we need to be particularly good, not just at detecting depressive disorders in particular, but separating the different types of depressive disorder into, the, into these, the, the more uh, biologically determined group and the less biologically determined group. I know it's not fashionable and it's been called dualistic, but the truth is it's actually very useful as all categorical classifications are. You know, we can talk dimensional and the categorical and they both have pros and cons. But this is useful because it helps us determine treatment much more effectively. 
major depression, on the other hand, uh, that the D DSM developed has blurred that boundary and it's meant that a great number of people have probably been given SSRIs in particular and other newer antidepressants that are perhaps not necessary and potentially harmful. So we want to be better at detecting it but we want to be better at classifying it as well to get the treatment uh, right. Finally, we know that the melancholic group is particularly predictive of suicide. And it's true that non-melancholic people in distress in all kinds of ways uh, kill themselves as well, but the uh, melancholic group are, are much more prone to suicide. And so, and, and it's entirely treatable, as you know, so we need to pick that group. Um, uh, so, the classification that we're using nevertheless must recognise the fact that for every one person with melancholic depression, GPs are seeing perhaps 10 uh, or perhaps more with non-melancholic depression and perhaps 100 with just non-specific distress of various kinds. And so the suicide rates are comparable in those different groups if, in a sense, but the um, Severe group, uh, the melancholic and indeed psychotic depression, needs to be detected uh, because that is going to be much more responsive to drug treatment than the others. Let's look now at the vegetative syndrome to remind you of the details and the, of, of making this distinction. So the neurovegetative syndrome is characteristic both of melancholic depression and it's in its most severe form of melancholic depression is psychotic depression. Both of them have in common the neurovegetative syndrome. And the neurovegetative syndrome, sometimes called physiological shift syndrome, that you, you may have been taught, comprises firstly anhedonia. Anhedonia is uh, loss of interest, the loss of, of passion, loss of motivation. And uh, we'll talk about that again in a moment. What else? In the neurovegetative syndrome, perhaps the next most important symptom is the uh, um, psychomotor retardation. In particular, retardation has always been recognised. Slowing, uh, bodily slowing, has been recognised as a most uh, important uh, symptom of the neurovegetative syndrome. People simply don't have the energy ability to get out of bed. They can barely move. Uh, they, they, they talk about this sort of feeling leaden and completely unable to to get around and when they do they're moving slowly. They feel that subjectively, they're very, very aware of it. Um, and, and patients, people will say, depending on their professions, they'll talk about it in different languages. So farmers sort of talk about not being able to lift the tractor anymore, joking as they do, you know. Um, I've had women talking to me about breaking more crockery than they've broken uh, in the last months, um, more than years and so on and so on. So it's, it's a very well recognised part of the syndrome among, amongst the patient group and we perhaps have underrated that, under, under misunderstood it. The cognitive elements the, in, in the psychomotor, reta, the psycho part of psychomotor actually means cognitive and this is the pseudo dementia that you know about um, and that's a, uh, expressed often in being overwhelmed with decision making, unable to make decisions, unable to think, to remember, and it's, it's a subcortical syndrome, so it's about uh, unable to remember because it wasn't registered in the first place, if you, if you like, because of poor concentration and poor um, you know, focus generally. What else? Fatigue is very much a part of it. Anergia, sometimes called anergia fatigue, different to the slowness. Uh, fatigue is a, is a different aspect of not moving and not doing things, as is anhedonia, the lack of motivation, loss of interest. All three of those things contribute to someone just not getting out of bed uh, uh, and having no purpose or reason to do so. So fatigue is, is very evident, but it's, uh, it's non-specific. Um, it's highly sensitive symptom, but it's not specific and not so useful diagnostically. Sleep disorder, on the other hand, is highly specific pattern of sleep disorder and therefore useful diagnostically. 
early morning wakening, you all remember, often just broken sleep after midnight, but particularly early morning wakening. And if a patient acknowledges that symptom is present, then you, clearly you go on and ask about diurnal mood variation, feeling worse in the morning and perhaps a bit lighter as the day goes on. And that's not just mood, in fact, it's all of the symptoms improve uh, as the day goes on. Unless they're very, very severely ill, where, where you go beyond that, so they're still bad in the afternoon as well. Um, then uh, weight loss is typical. Uh, traditionally weight loss could be quite significant. In the old days it was considered to be a stone of weight loss. Of course that varies on the, entirely with the severity as I'll show you in a minute. Um, and, but it can be quite markedly severe and ultimately in psychotic depression, you know, inanition, uh, not willing to eat at all. Uh, urogenital symptoms traditionally menorrhea, uh, um, Amenorrhea in women was traditionally the, uh, the, the symptom that some women presented with or disturbed periods may well be uh, due to depressive illness. So that's the kind of group of symptoms that we've always traditionally called the neurovegetative syndrome. And it's very, very valuable, useful, because it, it uh, helps us to, to detect, as it were, recognise that what we're dealing with is melancholic depression. And it reminds us also with these physical symptoms of the need to separate out um, the, or recognise that many of the physical symptoms that people present to GP may involve depression. And you're all familiar with Murta, who, which include, who includes um, depression, of course, in, in his uh, top 10. So just using the example of anhedonia, with this graph represents, in a sense, um, you can draw the same graph for all of the symptoms of, uh, of melancholic depression in terms of severity. So, so the spectrum of severity still exists, even though the classic classification variable is the type of depression, if you like, uh, characterised by the neurovegetative symptom. But within that uh, group, you can have mild, moderate and severe, and in, with the melancholic group, with, you can have the psychotic picture as well. So here we see a spectrum of mood, uh, of uh, potential capacity for uh, positive and negative emotions, which slowly drifts down to apathy in a context of depression. So it's not just about mood. What we see here is not just the inability to experience pleasure, which is what anhedonia is, it's the inability to experience emotion generally. So their capacity for emotion contracts down to virtually nothing as the illness gets more severe. So that con contraction of the experience of emotions might start with a bit of flatness or progress to numbness, emotional numbness, to emptiness. I had a patient once use the term cosmic emptiness to complete psychotic nihilism, non-existence. And the point is that what you see is loss of passion, loss of interest, that in milder states it's simply you know, perhaps a partner talking about the, 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 their spouse's loss of interest in their roses that they absolutely love. Lots of dead heads everywhere in the garden. Or he just got his engine that he's been looking for for ages to, to put into the old Land Rover and now he's disinterested, hasn't touched it. It's been there for two months now and he hasn't touched it. That's the description of anhedonia that you'll probably hear, likely to hear from patients. And these are the things that patients say, the depressive rumination, the negativity and pessimism that characterises depression and, and the nature of the low mood in depressive disorders. They, we, traditionally we talk about hopelessness, pointlessness, worthlessness and guilt. So hopelessness is the idea of nihilism. There is nothing. There will be nothing. There, everything's terrible. Everything um, is going to pot, war, disaster, famine, and never, it won't get better, um, and so on and so on. And psychotic nihilism is about non-existence at all. I don't exist. You can have a patient sitting in front of you saying, I don't exist, doctor. Um, pointlessness is the idea, again, of sort of linked to nihilism or in, Pointlessness is the other way of talking about nihilism, of there is nothing, there's no point to anything, there is no future, um, uh, everything's terrible. Uh, worthlessness is active self-deprecation. This is not just low self-esteem, this is active, 
I am a bad person. I have been a terrible person and I always will be a terrible person. I'm a terrible mother. I've ruined my children. Um, they probably would be better off without me. And sometimes, as you know, the mother may well kill the children when she suicides uh, as because she doesn't want them to grow up in this terrible world, which is a psychotic perception, of course, of just how bad things are. And the ruminations about guilt are, the, are that similar sort of idea. I've, I've been a terrible person. Uh, I'm going to be responsible for losing the farm. You know, five generations in the farm and the drought is terrible. It's a useful thing, um, and, and you know, that comment, I'm a waste of space and, you know, using other people's oxygen. It's really useful to remind me that when you talking to these people, it's, it's valuable, if possible, to have the patient's partner in the room. A farmer who says, I've ruined everything, I'm a terrible farmer, um, I'm going to lose the farm, we've lost, it's all hopeless, we can never recover from this. You'll often have the partner, let's say a wife of a male farmer, saying, it's not true, doctor, it's actually not true. We've, actually, we've got money in the bank, we've still got some feed left, we can go on for some time yet, We've been through this before. It's not as bad as other times. We'll be fine. What he's saying isn't true. I don't know why he's saying it, doctor. What's wrong? That's depression. Other aspects of the diagnosis. Sometimes patients, again, with their partners, uh, the partner might say that he's changed. The family will say that he's changed. Different kinds of behavior. Perhaps it's often described in behavioral terms or personality change. Behaviorally, the patient becomes more risk, uh, takes more risks perhaps. Sometimes they will uh, be more avoidant, they'll withdraw, they'll be silent, they won't engage with the family, they'll take to eat, eating meals in their bedroom and so on. Um, and sometimes that behaviour will be misunderstood. Uh, that withdrawal and disinterested in sex and so on uh, has famously been understood by the partner to be infidelity, that's obviously he doesn't care about us anymore. Um, and it's not true, it was simply depression. So these are the stories that, that you need to be mindful of and aware of, that the, the um, change of behaviour and change of personality, more withdrawn than usual, um, no longer talking, but sometimes more irritable, more grumpy, yelling at the kids when he's never been like that at all. Um, and and Behavior, uh, risk taking behaviours again sometimes financially making silly decisions not manic kind of decisions but just making bad decisions generally so and, and the other thing is general word that attaches to these behaviours is sometimes just uncharacteristic famous story about a primary school teacher who was f very very popular um, and f one day slapped a kid in, in the schoolyard and, uh, was, and went home and shot himself because, uh, because in fact he'd been depressed, terribly depressed for a long, long time, and the, and hitting the child, which is so out of character for him, was was the depressive illness. Speaking, incredible sadness, and this is often how patients present, not with our usual clinical language. We need to be mindful of this. Of course, with a mental state examination, what we see is um, altered affect, and in seriously depressed people, it's. It's not hard to pick, obviously. People are depressing to be with. They're not talking, they're not engaging. They, they are monosyllabic. There's no prosody in their language. They don't move much. They have re reduced response latency um, and you know, reduced blink, uh, reduced postural movement and, and then walking. They're, they're slumping, bowed forward, looking like someone with Parkinson's without the tremor. And gray skin and so on. Uh, so that mental state examination is generally obvious, but it's, when it's more mild, uh, it can be more difficult to recognise the, and the patient will be talking in terms of physical illness often, and so it need, you need to be alert to this idea that, that this could be depression. Then the other traditional things, family history and past history. With family history, remember the family history is highly predictive. Uh, um, melancholic disorder is highly hereditable. Um, so the family history is terribly useful in diagnosis. Remember that family history may not be formal. It may not be uh, that the great aunt was ever diagnosed with depression, but she, there's the family myth that she, or history that she took to her bed 
often for months at a time, that's probably a positive history of depressive episodes. Um, uh, and you, the other thing that you need to be alert to with past history in particular is that for young people that you need to track them back to uh, high school, uh, late high school, um, university years and so on because the those earlier episodes are often less mild, uh, less severe, they're often milder and perhaps never were recognised and never and the patient didn't seek help. So it's often the case that the first diagnosis is made on a second, third or fourth episode. So it's important to track it back and recognise that there were previous episodes because adding up all those episodes help us to understand um, the growing severity and perhaps treatment resistance, which we'll talk about in a minute. Case finding questions in depression are, are useful, but the, the important point to make at the beginning is not to start with the question or even alerting the patient to your perception that this patient may have a depression early on at least, because sometimes that'll shut down patients, particularly males. Perhaps the best thing to do is ask questions that sample those different things we've talked about in the neurovegetative syndrome. So, have you lost interest uh, in things lately, which is the anhedonia question, is probably a good place to start. And often picks up the f immediately, particularly if the f uh, family member's in the room, uh, yeah, he's just lost interest in everything, doctor, he's not participating and so on. Have you felt slowed down, the, the motor retardation syndrome? The patient will very likely respond to this question positively. It, the subjective sense of slowing is something that the patient experiences profoundly uh, if, quite often. So they will generally talk about that. Have you been more self-critical? Um, the patient will probably respond to that positively if it's true, saying, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a waste of space. But they'll also qualify it by saying, but it's true, doctor, I am a, a waste of space where the partner will come in and say, no, he's just been terribly hard on himself lately. Um, the question about sleep is a useful one because of its specificity, that style of broken sleep after midnight or early morning wakening. If it's positive, track it through to uh, donal mood variation and see if that's there. And then maybe a question like, have you been feeling down lately? Uh, that question's not compulsory. You might already, uh, the whole point is that by now you should have a clear sense of what the diagnosis is. You should have probably, on those questions, you can make the diagnosis most likely. Um, you could go on if you're concerned about the severity to ask the the. Uh, question that detects psychosis, which is, have you been having irrational thoughts lately? It, it may not, but it's very likely to detect uh, psychotic depression. And surprisingly, the patients are generally quite able to t discuss that and tell you about uh, their, un their, their thoughts, uh, the unusual things that they've been thinking about. And it might allude to talk, talking about death as well in particular, which we'll come to later as well. So just a few words about treatment. Firstly, it's important to say that all depressive disorders of any kind, including the distress that barely even reaches criteria for depression, needs psychological support or definitive psychotherapies. So all depression needs psychological support and, uh, and probably psychotherapy. And that includes melancholic depression. The difference is that with melancholic depression, you're also going to use medication. And the implication of what I'm saying is I hope that you will focus the use of medication, particularly on this more severe group, and perhaps use, or certainly not go to medication on early consultations. You should at least wait a couple of weeks with counselling and support, not necessarily uh, with someone other than yourself. You can do this, do, do the simple support and counselling. As you know, in general practice, quite a few things are self-limited. Some of it will go away. But if not and you're concerned, you may uh, uh, start medication. Just talking about medication for a moment, it's important that uh, there's a lot of trend uh, at the moment to uh, try medication and if it's not working after a couple of weeks to switch uh, to try something else. 
I would counsel against early switching. You should usually see a, an effect in the first week or so. An early response in the first seven or 10 days predicts a good response. But the absence of an early response does not predict treatment failure. They can still come good. So don't rush, don't switch early, but mostly go to your target dose, stay on that dose. Do not elevate to high doses. Stay on your, the target dose, which should be a really solid dose of a of good antidepressant, and then leave them on that drug for some time, like at least four weeks maybe six weeks before your countenance treatment uh, changing. And if the patient is older, the older the patient is, or more particularly, the more depressive episodes they've had, in other words, the time spent ill, accumulated time spent ill, will predict treatment uh, response latency. The idea that the longer they've had depressed, the, the more episode, the more the ep subsequent episodes become a little bit more frequent, they can become a little bit more severe, a little bit more, um, uh, treatment resistant and the response latency increases. So it may be that in a 60 uh, or, or 70 year old that you're treating with depression, you might need to wait six months or even nine months, but don't give up. It might be, admittedly, if it's getting to that, you might feel uh, like augmenting, but, but think carefully before you switch, particularly in an older patient wait as long as you can. It's hard work for everybody to wait. It's very, uh, you know, behaviourally unsound. The lack of a positive response is not encouraging, but it is, so it's difficult, but, and the patient will need a lot of support and their family will need a lot of support, but it's worth persisting. Now, just finally to talk about suicide, detection of suicidality. We've already got to this point where you may be dealing with someone who's quite severely ill. Clearly the detection of suicidality involves high index of suspicion in the first place and clearly you'll be on to it if you're dealing with someone who you think's got melancholic or psychotic depression. Also with that, if they've got other psychiatric comorbidities, I mean if there's, or if there's a family history of bipolarity or schizophrenia, um, other serious illnesses, then it's uh, very likely or entirely reasonable to consider uh, the that th these things aggravate the potential for suicidality, as you know. It's important to be aware of predictive um, and protective factors that uh, are well known. We know about, uh, you know, that it's pr predictive things are the lack of a confiding relationship, isolated, older, male with a painful condition. Remember Danny talked about the idea of pain and other comorbidities. Those things are all predictive of uh, increased risk of suicide, whereas uh, a good relationship, still being married, um, having supportive community, being basically reasonably well otherwise and so on, uh, and having faith, a religious faith, are all things that tend to protect, uh, protect from suicidality. So you need to have those in the back of your mind when you have someone in front of you. Sometimes the uh, concern is raised by someone else about the uh, about uh, the prospect of suicide. The person's been talking about it, uh, talking about death or concern raised in some way, uh, and the patient's brought to you because of that. And sometimes there's already been an attempt or a failed attempt, and so and it's another way that patients come to care. So uh, suicide detecting of the suicidality ultimately, however, results in uh, is a process of uh, suspecting it and asking the patient specifically about it. It's most important that you talk about it. We know that the discussion of suicide or suicidality with patients does not cause people to kill themselves. Absolutely not true. Every piece of evidence has, that's ever been explored has demonstrated that the more we raise the topic, the more we talk about it, the, the more we can save lives. Patients get tremendous relief being able to talk about these frightening thoughts that they're having. There is, of course, another part of them that is resisting and doesn't want to die. And it's about talking to that patient, if you like, that part of the patient. So we traditionally use the hierarchy of suicidal, uh, of suicidality, the questions that you ask, starting with tiredness with life, the sense of a bit flat, a bit numb. Have you been feeling down lately? This is if you've not even, if, if you've 
track, not track the depression aspect and they've been brought because of suicidal intention or, th or thought. You'll start with some of the depressive things and, and this tiredness of life. Um, uh, and that, but the next thing that's more typical is the discussion of or thoughts of death. So have you been thinking about, typically have you been thinking about death and dying? Have you been thinking about getting cancer and thinking that's probably not a bad thing, I'd be, you know, be good to die, I'd be better off dead or they'd be better off without me, those kind of ideas. And anyway, it's hopeless, there's no point in living, I'm a waste of space and so on. That negativity, thinking about death and mortality is, is a sign of suicidal risk. Then there's the idea of ideation, suicidal ideation, and you ask directly, have you thought about doing something about this yourself? Have you thought about harming yourself? Have you? And, and the next question becomes um, uh, preparation. Have you um, uh, thought about um, how you might do it? Have you planned it? Have you rehearsed it? Have you bought equipment? Uh, have you been um, uh, doing things related to, to starting to take your own life. So for farmers, that's often an observation that the farmer's been cleaning the rifle a lot more lately than usual or buying things. Uh, sometimes patients will admit to having driven to the forest where they'll, um, and, and even rehearsed putting the pipe on the exhaust and so on and so on. And Finally, there'll be this, the idea of, uh, of a trial run and, and a practice run and, and then even an attempt which failed or, or they didn't go through with. So there's this hierarchy that we can discern of patients thinking that when, when talking to them. And the, the, the thing to notice then is that sometimes when the patient raises one of those topics, if they've talked about, you know, buying something or, you know, or the spouse talks about cleaning the gun, the thing to do is to come in at that point, but don't stop there. Keep going down the hierarchy and checking out whether they've actually gone further than the wife was aware of with the gun. Do you see what I mean? Even a failed attempt or chickening out at the last minute or something like that. So track it. Then the, if you're confident that you are dealing with someone who is at risk of suicide, you need to assess the immediate risk, what are you going to do? The short term management in a sense, what are you going to do now? And the way to do that is to, having got that conversation going when talking about the hierarchy, is to pursue that with the patient in this very, very open way. Uh, and patients are both surprised and relieved to be able to do that. But the next question that's so useful is to say, how safe do you feel now? To you, how safe are you uh, at the moment do you feel safe about your own capacity to hurt yourself? And have uh, that discussion. It can be very illuminating and, and tells you a great deal about um, what you need to do next. And so you can ask that question of the patient. What do you think we need to do about it? Because you're now thinking, do I need to refer this patient? Do I need to set up a vigil? How am I going to manage it? That kind of thing. So how dangerous are you to yourself? And perhaps you might ask if you think concerned have you thought about harming anyone else? Uh, because that's a question that uh, is important to ask sometimes, but it could be, but, and usually the patient won't demur, they won't be fussed by you asking that question. So don't be frightened of asking that question, it's usually quite revealing. Often they'll say, no, not at all, it, but you know, I'm, I should go. But other times they'll say, yeah, I have been thinking of the children or something. And then, as I said, what do you think we should do now? Uh, because, and that leads into, because what I'm thinking we need to do is, is, is um, uh, engage the, your family and start to talk about it amongst the family. What are we going to do? A few cautions. Be very aware of, be sceptical of minimisation in those discussions. Patients will often minimise in that discussion. Um, so persist with the discussion of vigil and other people being involved. They will often resist that. Perhaps you're thinking, I've got to admit this person. Again, they may well resist that, but persist. Require someone to come, whack them in the car, take them to in yourself into the hospital, those kind of things. Be prepared to, to go beyond the norm, as it were. Um, and you can even uh, start talking about things like suicide contracts and so on.
Remember, the suicide contract is only as good as your relationship with the patient. Um, it's clear that sometimes they're useful, perhaps with some kinds of people. Um, but on the whole, they're only as meaningful as uh, your relationship with the patient. And it's, it's very, very hard for the patient to, to stick to that uh, relationship, uh, that promise to you when they are in the early hours of the morning feeling like killing themselves. Um, they may not be able to hold on. On the other hand, it may just make the difference. I can't let my doc down, you know, doc who, Dr John, who, who I've, who's looked after me all my life and I know very well. That might actually make the difference, but it depends on who that doctor is in the patient's mind, if you know. So the rest of the management, and you know well, it's about deciding whether you're going to contract to get the family involved, whether we can do a vigil, whether we need to set up referral, and it depends on your contacts and where you practice and so on. So uh, that's kind of the, the, the discussion of suicide that, that you well know and, and need to track forward. So in summary, what I'm saying is that we need to go back to recognising that the de that the classification variable for depression is not severity alone. It's the type of depressive disorder that we need to focus on. We need to recognise that the severe group that's characterised by the old endogenous pattern or melancholic depression with neurovegetative symptoms needs physical treatment as well as psychological treatment. Uh, and they are the ones who particularly will respond to drug treatment. But the drug treatment may take time, particularly if the patient's older, to kick in and you've got to persist and uh, be dogged about that. But try not to load the patient up with lots of different drugs and try not to switch a lot because each time that happens you're dumping them. And be very alert to the prospect of suicide, particularly in this severe group and, and of course the psychotic group. With psychosis, of course, you will also most likely be referring, but if you can't for some reason, you'd be adding an antipsychotic most likely to the, to the uh, antidepressant. Um, and then Danny will now talk about um, treatment or, or the other resources that uh, you can draw upon to uh, beyond these, this clinical discussion, uh, and I'll hand over to Danny. So Jeff has talked about what constitutes good clinical care in general practice. And good clinical care in general practice is necessary in the Alliance model. We have to have GPs who can recognise and respond to depression. It's necessary but it's not sufficient because in this model that we're implementing, there are four pillars. And good effective general practice is one of the pillars. We know that's crucial. But the other three pillars are necessary too. One of the first pillar is we need to be able to identify high risk groups, people and individuals in communities. Identify them and respond to their need. The second pillar is we need to understand that we need community facilitators that are people in the community who can recognise depression and guide people to primary care. They are people like pharmacists and teachers <coughs> and priests. And the other focus is we have to have general public awareness campaign to understand what depression is and what depression isn't. And this has to be locally focused. And so those four pillars are part of the Alliance Against Depression. But, but still that's not sufficient. The crucial element for effective treatment is that those four pillars are integrated. How do we know this? We know this because of a trial that occurred in Bavaria, a treatment trial called the Nuremberg trial. And what they did was in this large multi-year trial was compare integrated alliance type treatment of depression in Nuremberg with business as usual in Würzburg where there were the four components. The difference being in Nuremberg they integrated to care and when they did this in the first two years suicide lacks reduced by 24 percent and that's the alliance against depression.
Dr. Daniel Rock is Principal Advisor and Research Director at WA Primary Health Alliance. Dr. Rock is an epidemiologist, a Fellow of the Royal Society for Public Health, and an adjunct professor in the School of Psychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences, University of Western Australia. Prior to his current role with the WA Primary Health Alliance, Dr. Rock was Deputy Executive Director at North Metropolitan Health Service Mental Health, Director of the NMHS MH Clinical Research Centre, and a Clinical Professor in the School of Psychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences and the School of Population Health at the University of Western Australia. From 2003 to 2008, he was the co-director of the Centre for Clinical Research in Neuropsychiatry based at Greylands Hospital. Dr Jeff Riley is an Honourable Senior Research Fellow in the Faculty of Health and Medical Science at the University of Western Australia and Professor of Rural and Remote Medicine. He trained in psychiatry and his career history includes time as a rural GP, Head of the School of Primary, Aboriginal and Rural Healthcare, Head of the School of Psychiatry and Director of the Rural Clinical School of Western Australia. He's respected for his professional and personal contributions to rural general practice, particularly for his commitment to the training and well-being of general practitioners themselves. Among his many honours is Member of the Order of Australia, which he received in 2010.